Welcome to the Anatomy and Physiology 2 series on the heart. When we look at the heart, we have to keep in mind that it's a muscular pump that contracts forcefully to pump blood out through the major vessels and either to the lungs to pick up oxygen or to the rest of the body, the systemic circuit, in order to deliver that oxygen to the tissues. When we look at the superficial anatomy of the heart, or the heart from the outside, we can see many major features. First, we see that the heart's divided into four chambers, or four smaller areas. On top, we have the two atria, and on the bottom, we have the two ventricles. The atria and ventricles are just named for the side of the heart that they're on. So here we have the right atrium, and over here we have the left atrium. Then again on the bottom, we have the right ventricle and the left ventricle. It's important to remember that when we're talking about right and left, it's the actual patient, or in this case, the actual heart's right and left. So when you're looking at it, it's going to be a mirror image to your right and left. You can also kind of tell which is right and left based on the ventricles. The left ventricle is bigger and bulkier with more mass, so you can always tell that this side of the heart is the left side of the heart. When we look at the atria from the front um, on this model here, you can really only see a little bit of them. But if we were to turn around to the back, you can see a lot more of their bulk. So remember that on an exam, they could be labeled on the back as well. So if you're not sure which chamber we're talking about, just kind of follow it around to the front, and that will help you identify. Again, right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. When we look at the atria, they appear to be a lot smaller chambers than the ventricles, but they can actually hold the same volume of blood. And that's because they have the ability to expand as they fill with blood. The atria can expand because they have these little appendages on them that we call an oracle. So this is the oracle. And then when we look at the left atrium, again, we see this bumpy little area called the oracle. Again, that just allows the atrium to expand as it fills with blood. <clears throat> when we look at the heart from the outside, we can also see that we have a few sulci or grooves that divide the heart. They kind of show us the separation between the ventricles on both the front of the heart and on the back of the heart. Sorry, right here. So when we're looking at the front of the heart, this groove here is called the anterior interventricular solstice. Anterior because it's the front of the heart and interventricular because it's between the two ventricles. Then when we look at the back of the heart, this groove right here is the posterior interventricular solstice. Posterior because it's the back of the heart and then again interventricular because it's between the two ventricles. You can also see that in both of these sulci we tend to have like little yellow colorations which just means that there's lots of fat there. And then you see that there's some major vessels that travel down the grooves. Again, we see it on the anterior side of the heart as well. These sulci or these grooves kind of provide a little canal or a little route for the blood vessels to traverse as they go around the heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we look at the heart, we also see that we have many major vessels attached to the top or base of the heart. First, when we look at the vessel that communicates with the right ventricle here, we see this large blue vessel that kind of comes up and curves around to the back of the heart. That's the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk is gonna take blood from the right ventricle and carry it towards the back of the heart. And then if we look in the back here, we see that it actually splits and it goes to the left and right side of the heart. When it splits, the pulmonary trunk becomes the pulmonary arteries. So we have the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. And these pulmonary arteries are just going to carry blood to the lungs to get oxygen. Once that blood picks up oxygen from the lungs, we see that it returns to the heart. And it's going to return to the left atrium here via these red vessels that we see. And these are pulmonary veins. Pulmonary because they're coming from the lungs, veins because they're returning to the heart. So we see that on the left side we have two pulmonary veins and on the right side we have two pulmonary veins. The other major vessel we see connected to the heart is this large red vessel here and this is the aorta. The aorta actually communicates with the left ventricle 
which is going to contract forcefully to pump blood out through the aorta into systemic circulation or to our body. When we look at the aorta, we see that it's actually broken up into multiple parts. This part of the aorta, aorta that's coming up is the ascending aorta because it ascends, it rises. This curvature right here is the aortic arch or the arch of aorta. And then finally over here, we see this part that starts to come down, which is the descending aorta. And we'll actually break the descending aorta up into multiple parts um, next chapter when we do the blood vessels. Um, I think that's it, looking at the heart from the outside. Oh, nope, the vena cava, sorry. Um, the other vessel, the vessels that we haven't spoken about yet are the vessels that carry blood from the body into the right atrium. So if we look up here at the top of the right atrium, we see the superior vena cava. Superior vena cava is going to bring deoxygenated blood from the top parts of the body and dump it into the right atrium. And then there's actually an inferior vena cava as well that comes down from the bottom of the right atrium and extends down the thoracic and abdominal cavities. We can't see the actual vessel here, but if we tip the heart upside down, you see this large hole where the vessel would enter, <clears throat> excuse me, where the vessel would enter the chamber. <clears throat> now we're going to actually open up these chambers so that we can see the internal anatomy of the heart. First, <clears throat> just opening up the atria, we see that on the inner walls of the atria, we have all of these muscular ridges. And these muscular ridges are just called pectinate muscles. Okay, so inside the atria, we have pectinate muscles. When we look inside the ventricles, we also see some larger muscular ridges. And these muscular ridges are called trabeculae carnae. Also, when we look inside the ventricles, we see that between the right and left ventricle, we have this thick septum or separator, a thick, strong wall that separates the ventricles. We call this wall the interventricular septum. <clears throat> when we look at the wall of the heart, we see that it has multiple layers. Shown here on this model, we see this dark red color that makes up most of the wall. And that's the myocardium, myo meaning muscle, cardi meaning heart. So the muscular layer of the heart wall. If you look really closely, um, you can see on the inner lining of this, we have this light pink layer here. This light pink line is showing us the membranous layer that covers the inner surface of these chambers. And that's the endocardium, okay, the endocardium. Remember that on the outer surface of the heart, we also have a membranous layer that's called the epicardium, but we don't actually see this on this model. When we look inside the heart, we also see that we have two sets of valves, or four valves total. We have two atrioventricular valves, and then we have two semilunar valves. The atrioventricular valves are the valves that are located on either side of the heart, between an atrium and a ventricle. We see that here on the right side of the heart, the atrium and the ventricle communicate with each other. And we have a one-way valve here that protects this hole to ensure that blood only flows from the atrium to the ventricle. And when the ventricle contracts, this valve gets forced closed so that blood doesn't flow backwards. When we look at these valves, we see that here on the right side of the heart, this valve right here is called the tricuspid valve because it's actually made up of three flaps or three cusps. When we look at the left side of the heart over here, you guys can see up in here, this valve on the left side of the heart is the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve. And that's because it has two cusps. Both of these atrioventricular valves have some associated structures that help to stabilize them. You see these strings that are hanging off of the flaps. These strings are called chordae tendinae, or, or tendinous cords. These cords attach to the free end of the flap and help to anchor it to the wall of the heart to secure the valve. When we look at the wall of the heart, we also see that we have these, <clears throat> excuse me, these little muscular bulges. These muscular bulges right here are papillary muscles. 
So the chordae tendineae attach to the valve flaps and then they stretch to the wall of the heart. And then we see the papillary muscles grab onto those cords and secure them to make sure that these valves only go up into the hole and close the hole. They don't actually swing backwards into the atria because then they wouldn't work. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other two valves that we need to know are the semilunar valves. The semilunar valves are at the base of the large arteries that lead out of the heart. These semilunar valves will help to ensure that we can squeeze to pump blood out of the ventricles, but then when the ventricle relaxes and there's no pressure pushing forward, the valves will snap closed so that blood doesn't flow backwards from the artery into the ventricle. These valves are named for the vessels that they're at the base of. So here at the base of the pulmonary trunk, we have the pulmonary semilunar valve or the pulmonic valve. You see it's just made up of three cusps and that we don't have any associated structures, no chordae tendineae and no papillary muscles. And then <clears throat> if we look up here in the left ventricle, we see this pulmonary semilunar valve here. Hey, that's the aortic semilunar valve because it's at the base of the aorta which communicates with the left ventricle. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so the last thing that we'll go ahead and cover today is coronary circulation. And coronary circulation <clears throat> just includes the vessels that supply blood to the actual heart muscle itself and then carry deoxygenated blood back from the heart muscle and dump it back into the heart. So really just the blood vessels that supply the heart muscle itself or the myocardium. Coronary circulation includes coronary arteries, okay, coronary arteries, which we see in red, carrying oxygenated blood to the heart, and then cardiac veins in blue, which will take deoxygenated blood from the myocardium and then dump it back into the right atrium. So when we look at the arteries that are gonna supply blood to the myocardium, the two major arteries that we see are the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. And both of these are going to branch off of the aorta. So we see the aorta here and going around here to the right side of the heart, we have the right coronary artery. Going off the aorta to the left side of the heart, we'll have the left coronary artery but it actually goes underneath um, other portions of the heart, so we can't see it well in this model. All we can see is this little tiny nub right here before the left coronary artery splits into other arteries. <clears throat> so starting with the right coronary artery over here, again, we see that it curves around the heart, and then right here we have this red vessel that comes down um, called the right marginal branch. Okay, so the right coronary artery comes down into the right marginal branch, serving the right front side of the heart. And then we see that the right coronary artery is going to curve all the way around towards the back of the heart. And then in the very back of the heart, we're going to see that it goes down into the posterior interventricular branch. Okay, so we have the right marginal branch and then the right coronary artery curves around and in the back of the heart goes down the interventricular solstice as the posterior interventricular branch. When we look at the left coronary artery, again, that we can just see this little nub of, we see that in the front of the heart, it goes down in this anterior solstice and that's called the anterior interventricular branch. <clears throat> the anterior interventricular branch. And then what we see is that this other branch of the left coronary artery actually curves around the side of the heart, and that's the circumflex branch. It circumflexes, goes around the left side of the heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now the veins, <clears throat> the cardiac veins. If we actually start at the back of the heart here, we see this really large kind of sac-like or bag-like vessel. This is the coronary sinus, and this is where all the deoxygenated blood ends up, and then it dumps into the right atrium. So when we look at the coronary sinus, we see that we have a couple veins going into it. 
One is the great cardiac vein. So looking at, again, the front of the heart and this anterior solstice, we see this big blue vessel that comes up the solstice and then it curves all the way around the left side of the heart. That's the great cardiac vein, the great cardiac vein. Then if we look over here at the right side of the heart a little bit, up here coming up by this red marginal branch, the blue vessel here is the anterior cardiac vein. Okay, so on the right side, it's the anterior cardiac vein. And then that flows up into this smaller vein that curves around towards the back of the heart. And that's the small cardiac vein. So we have the small cardiac vein coming up on the right side to go into the coronary sinus. And on the left side, we had the great cardiac vein coming up to go into the coronary sinus. The only other vein that we need to know is again in this posterior solstice. And this is the posterior interventricular vein. Okay, so going up the posterior solstice is the posterior interventricular vein. And that's it as far as cardiac anatomy. <clears throat> Excuse me. As far as cardiac anatomy, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them.